from uh, St. John Paul XXIII. Um, consult not your fears, but your hopes and your dreams. Think not about your frustrations, but about your unfulfilled potential. Concern yourself not with what you've tried and failed in, but what is still possible for you to do. And so as we move on to the board, I would hope those words would guide this board and our executive staff to make decisions that will recognize and perpetuate the hopes and the dreams of our tenacious classroom teachers and our precious students. Decisions that will recognize and inspire the unfulfilled potential of our tenacious teachers and our precious students. The decisions that will instill and perpetuate the future and possibilities of our tenacious teachers and precious students. We ask this in your name, your Lord, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I need a motion for the adoption of the agenda. Move approval. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Mr. Dodd. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Do you have any citizens' comments? Thank you. <laughs> All right. School operations. Mr. Mullen, we've got somebody here for the to approve the amendment. There you go. Miss Algarella. <laughs> to approve the amendment to the 217 218 Code of Student Conduct. This is the advertise for you. For public hearing on October 10th. Well, it says approve the amendment. <laughs> Can I approve the amendment? To no, 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 no. You got to present it first. I do have to. You have she has it. We've got to change it. We just have to get approval to advertise. Right. Approved approve to advertise. Don't right. say approve the amendment. No, no. I was going to read it. It later says to advertise. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's. She's go ahead. Uh, uh, approve Sorry. the amendment to the 2017-2018 Code of Student Conduct to advertise yeah. the amendment for a public hearing at the October 10th, 2017 school board meeting. Okay. Uh, just a point of uh, reference, a point of order, I mean. Um, I think, Mr. Kennedy, what we're saying is we're not approving the amendment, though, right? We're only approving the advertising. Of the amendment. Yeah, I'm re I was reading as they, that's right. the, we've always been instructed to say. So we have a motion by Mr. Kennedy? To approve the amendment, to approve to advertise the amendment. Right. There you go. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Will you second that, Mr. Dodd? I will second that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, <laughs> do you have anything you need to say? Not necessarily. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bishop? Yes, sir. Go to approve the secondary and dual enrollment education courses agreement. This is a TC. Did you get your parents home? Did I get my parents home? Yeah. Oh, no, not yet. I, this weekend. <laughs> this weekend, okay. <laughs> If you have any questions for this position, yes. We have a motion. I make a motion we approve the secondary and dual enrollment education courses agreement between our school board and the Suffolk County School Board. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Dodd, a second by Ms. Counts. Do we have any questions? Is this typically the time that we get this, or was this? No, we should have been a little earlier. We just, um, between Sumter County communication and ours, a little longer. Because this was new for them, our old articulation agreement. Well, our old articulation agreement that we had the last several years, um, they were not paying for any costs, so it took a little more discussion on their part to make sure they were covering costs. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Susie. Is that microphone on, Susie? Good morning. Good morning. I am here to ask the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the goldenrod. Okay. I can't believe I can't yeah. believe Adam and Tanya is leaving Christopher Middle School. Good morning. Because How are you? Good to see you. I didn't think he was allowed. I don't think he is allowed. <clears throat> Everything but an animal opinion. He's supposed to be leaving. In December, but I don't think that's gonna happen. You bet I mentioned it to Tom and she's like, oh, really? It just doesn't sound right. Not right. 
It's a good man. We love him. Uh, go ahead and make a motion to approve instructional and support recommendations. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Kennedy, a second by Ms. Powers. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Okay, quick update. We have hired so far this year 105 teachers. Currently, we have 38 long-term subs in vacant positions. We have 33 positions posted, but you know in our world, it is constantly moving, so we do have teachers being hired currently at this time. So they will replace those long-term subs. We have 22 in the elementary, 10 in the middle school, and six in the high school. 26 out of those 38 have degrees. Four out of the 30, 26 out of the 38 have degrees. Four of the 38 are certified, but those four have, for whatever reason, not come back. They may be retired teachers, just long-term subbing to help us out. And 18 out of the 38 are working towards certification. So that number was higher than what I originally thought. So the 18 out of the 38 are working. They either need to take a subject area test or the general <coughs> knowledge test. Um, board and superintendent, um, We've talked about this in the past, but I, I think it's still worth exploring again. And that is our great retired teachers and utilizing what are you them. About? <laughs> and utilizing them in a more creative way to fill some of these positions, especially I'm thinking at the high school level where we have sometimes the most difficulties in the maths and the sciences. I, I know they have contract services that, that we could run them through that potentially maybe there's a teacher that says listen i i'd love to teach one course for this next semester um we wouldn't necessarily have to worry about one position or two positions we could maybe do that and i'm just wondering if it's really time to re-explore some of those options again i believe when they come to us and they talk about retirement i think susie and we do have that conversation with them if they would like to come back we can certainly pursue it and be a little more consistent on it i know the elementary world would hire a few of them um, we'll come back to teach full time even. So Randy right. Hobson's back. And and we've had administrators that have <laughs> yeah. come back into the classroom. So, and we're not opposed to that. But I'm, so I'm thinking in the that, past that, that, you know, we've been a little more reluctant to say, well, we want to split a position or something, but we don't have that luxury anymore. And but some of them are getting strong to me. Well, and, and that was my question is, if they can run through a contract service, then we can rehire them the next day. So, I, I mean, I just... We have a relationship with contract services now that we could do that. Do what we can't fill a position. Because I mean, I, I can think of a number of teachers in the you know in the teachers retirement association or, or the uh, group that's here locally that they've talked about. They'd love to come out and we will, do a course. Um, we'll put that on our administrator principals meeting, and we'll make that announcement to principals that if any teachers retiring or those any who have retired that they can certainly work through that contract service and come in early if that's their option. And I wonder if maybe we reach out to like Terry Rooks or somebody and, and who's, I think she's president of the uh, retired, retired teachers. Retired mm -hmm. teachers and, and we have sent out that list, not this year, but we have sent out the, that list in the past of retired teachers so that principals call the retired teachers and make those connections and to based from the direction of Ms. Hummel, we do pay if they come back to be subs or come back to us, we do pay fingerprinting and drug testing. We cover that cost for them. That's, and that's huge. So, that's huge. yes, Excellent. because we appreciate them coming back. <coughs> okay, Carrie, Carrie's president of the retired teachers, I'm secretary. So um, there is going to be a push to um, the focus has been more on having lunch than anything else I think in the past. And so Terry's uh, young and aggressive and and so she's going to make a move for what can that group do to help our teachers Very good. Um, you know they've been focusing on selling baskets and raising money and scholarship for kids but I, I think the focus is going to change for what can we do for our teachers and she has skin in the game her son's one of our teachers mm -hmm. okay. thank you thank you Ms. Lane all right attorney legal matters oh, all right other business that needs to come before the board Mr. Mullen Ms. Powers. Ms. Powers. No. Mr. Kennedy. Just to, to thank um, Mr. Mullen and the superintendent and staff on addressing some concerns with our new uh, recess requirement and mandate. And I think um, that the district is trying to do everything we can while 
balancing uh, the challenge of mandate of having a structured physical activity time and a free recess. And I do think that we need to, as we talk to our legislators and as we build our legislative agenda, we need to get that spa removed out of the mandate because, they, you know, they gave us spa, now they've given us recess, they haven't given us more minutes in the day. And uh, we're doing what we can, but it's it's challenging. The parents are not happy. No, they're not. I talked to a, I talked to a parent yesterday, and I said you need to call Tallahassee. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're the culprits. And what they what they're doing at this one school with this precious little boy that I know <laughs> is having him out there right before he has to go home for ten or twenty minutes. He's exhausted. He's a little guy. Well, I, I think it's hot. Again, it should be a local control <laughs> issue, and it should be uh, it should not be the legislators making decisions in our classroom. If, if I were making a decision for that child and his classmates, we would be in an air-conditioned room, sitting on the floor, having stories told to us. Eating chocolate. No, eating <laughs> chocolate. Somebody <laughs> might be over. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. Um, I'll save all my comments for the health insurance update. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you won't. Okay. Put a smile on Sherry's face. That's good. All right. Well, it's adjourned, and now we're going to workshop. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Thank y'all. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'm here just to get the board's feedback for our 2018-19 school calendar. So we do this every year. This is our first step of the whole process. Um, of course, you can't read that. There's such there are tiny, tiny names there, but it's all of our calendar committee, which no. is basically showing that we have representation from all schools, from all levels, um, throughout throughout the district. Our timeline. One, one second. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it's the Citrus County School Board is blank. No, to the right. To the right. The committee member is Sandy Counts. Oh, I see. Okay. What is the the left one? We are not That's blank. For, if you have a principal oh, or supervisor. Right. We're so a we, bunch of things, but we're I'm, not blank. I've got my new. Uh, I'm sorry. That middle column. Our one up. Right. That middle I column. Okay. So is Sandy the committee, is, right? I should probably put this on two right. slides. <laughs> Sandy, Ms. Counts is Ms. Counts our, is our rep. Okay. That is correct. Thank you. So our timeline, starting with today, is step one. Um, I come and I seek input from the superintendent and the school board regarding the calendar. And then from that point, we um, list our calendar committee members to all of our schools, uh, and we notify our committee at least two weeks prior to our meeting that we are going to be having on September 13th. The calendar committee of all those people that you just saw before are going to meet on, like I said, September 13th to develop two or three calendar options. Um, we then submit those options to the board and the superintendent for review and approval. That'll be in October. Um, we, once we utilize the input to finalize no more than three of the options, we submit it to all <coughs> staff and staff committees for their review and vote. Um, principals, of course, we advise them and remind them to schedule a SAC meeting during that time. They have then within 30 calendar days to then you know, vote. Each employee has one vote and each SAC at each school has one vote. And then, of course, they calculate their votes and they send those to us to the district. We then have a subcommittee um, in November, November 17th, that gets together and um, it includes a CCEA rep. Um, we tally the countywide vote. And then on December 12th, I come to the board again to share um, what the majority of the support was as determined by the vote and submitted to you as recommendation for approval. And if the calendar is rejected by the board at that time, the calendar committee then reconvenes and we go back to step four and continue on. Any questions with the timeline? Well, 
-hmm. I guess my only question would be on number 12. I mean, it's the ultimate decision of the school board, correct? Correct. So if the calendar is rejected by the school board, the calendar committee reconvenes to act upon those recommendations from the school board and the process begins again at step four, where we reconvene, where we notify the committee that we will be meeting again and we redo the calendar options, of course, and go through the whole process again with the voting and then coming back to you. Okay. I, I just, you know, I, I thought that the school board makes the final approval or makes the final decision. Correct. Okay. So if the school board decided on step 11 to approve a calendar, it wouldn't have to go to 12, would it? Correct. Oh, yeah. You notice number 11 and 12 are on that same date of December 12th. So on December 12th, I come to the board, the calendar comes to like I show you what the majority of it was I tell you what the votes were um, and then you some you then approve the recommendation from the district or you don't approve it if you don't approve it then we go back to the committee and start over you approve the like I tell you who the majority was the vote the what calendar option was voted for the most if you approve that if you, we then go forward, of course, with that as our new calendar. However, if you do not approve it, you give our you know, feedback of why and so forth, we then reconvene and start over with step four. It would be just like textbook or anything else. We, we you approve the or we approval. deny. Correct. And then the process repeats right. itself. So one of the things that I made a point on last year was to have some options on the, the, the calendar. You know that they are not just one or two days different everything's the same i know we're bound by testing and when we can start school and all those things so there's some limits i understand that but my hope is that the calendar committee could have some true options for teachers because i i thought the way i read the law was we we set the school calendar the school board. we do but I've, I've served on that committee for a number of years <laughs> if you sit in that room you're talking about moving an inch one way or an inch another because the number they can they, you can, they can say we're going to begin here and end here and then they give you all the test dates and you cannot have your your holidays your time off during those test dating um calendar. maybe one semester one to have so similar number of days when a all of those mandates are added back in there is no movement you have one day or two days right. different and so i guess so there part isn't flexibility. Point, part of my point I'm making then is why do we go to all this extreme when there's no flexibility? Why do we put all these man hours into this process when there is no flexibility? Because so we're make that calendar and contract. stick with it. Why don't is that what you're saying? You know, we I do. Mean, possibly and, two and extra options versus three. That is, that is that what you're saying? You know, would be. I no. mean, we are. You know, we're required by law to, of course, go through this process. Absolutely we're required by law. And you have a bargaining contract that requires. Well, we can bring two options. We can. If, two options versus three. We're still or, go, I don't know that. We have to. We can't do more than three options by law. Here's the, the one thing: our district has been praised around the state and even within the communities of having one of the most transparent, collaborative processes. So while you may have been frustrated with the idea of that there wasn't a lot of options, the most people were involved in trying to create a calendar that best fit the needs of not just the teachers but the parents in the community as oh, well definitely I and and so without this process you're circumventing them no this I, process is, is what is necessary in order to come <coughs> out with an outcome that has that transparent and collaborative process is if you can think of another way to do that i'm not just not sure how you would without it, I mean, removing this process is the process. Well, I think that, I mean, the That goal, didn't make any sense, and I understood it perfectly, to be honest. I don't know if I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that last statement was good. Um, but I appreciate that, and I appreciate that we have involvement. Definitely, we want to have involvement. But I'm just saying, when does it come to the point that is the work of this committee and the extreme number of members that it takes to do this at what point do we get to when we say, well, there's there's no options. I mean, we're bound by these state dates and times. Right. Why Basically, we, the options why are, we are doing all that? win half days or <coughs> win half days or not. I, I would like to see the law. Yeah, sure. Really? 
I don't disagree with you, okay? Because okay? I hate wasting people's times, and they put a lot of time and effort in this. And I think when the options are put out there, it's pretty transparent. I think there's a lot of people involved, and I think the point goes back to tell the schools you have representation on the committee. We know that they're pretty well locked into time frames, mandates, test dates, Christmas holidays, and those types of things. So there aren't a lot of options to most calendars across the state anymore, especially since the legislators now tell us what day to start school on. So um, I can't wait till August 10th on a Saturday. We may have to start on a Saturday one year, but um, but I don't disagree with that. I don't know that that will ever come because it's also part of the union contract, and maybe that's a conversation we have with the union contract to see if maybe they want to, you know, streamline a little bit. I don't know that answer, but it could, we could certainly take to the table, but um, especially with the restrictions we have. So, well, it's just a, right a, now, a good discussion to have. But right now, it's, it is what it is. Yeah, but we have, and, and I know you know this, Mr. Dodd, we have a lot of processes that are required under statute. We have a textbook pop process, selection process, that has gotten enormously larger. And it, it requires a great deal of, of time and energies. We have a number of times, anytime we make decisions, we want a collaborative, transparent process, and that does take man hours to do that. If we want to just make unilateral decisions, we can do that at times, but that may not be that the, the best decisions come out of those processes. <laughs> but we would all agree that if the dates that the state gives us is so set that there's only one option, then we don't have to have a committee, right? But there do, are. We, do we agree to that? No. Do we agree to that? Because, because, if, because you if still there's have. a time that comes where this is the only option you have. They're never going to no tell discussion. us when our half days have to be. That's exactly or, it. Or, or things like that. Or, when or, you're professional or, or a week off for Thanksgiving. Or those kinds of things are never going to give us that. Um, that exact. So and there always will be a variety, maybe just not the variety that you're wanting there to be between two options. Right. I mean, last year's options were what one day. On there were half Christmas. day differences. Mm -hmm. You're right. Like there yeah. were basically that was it. We had the same beginning and end date. Right. We and did have differences, nice. and when we came back from Christmas break, when teachers started, when um, right. students came back, that those kind of changes were there. Right. Yeah. I just it's just I'm just looking at the man hour to <coughs> spend on this if it. there's not very many options for us. And so. I think this is another fine example of local control that we don't have. Right. Absolutely. You know, and it's I, you're right. those things That's that they tell us local control, but yet they dictate pretty well everything that goes in our county. And this has dramatically changed. This process has been in place for over two decades. Mm -hmm. And it has been primarily in the last six years that this changed dramatically because Citrus County for a number of years took the option through the calendar committee recommendation to take a waiver and start school early because we felt it was in the best interest of our school. We were high achieving school district. Right, because we were a high achieving district. The state decided after they had listened to Disney, and that was exactly who lobbied the, the state legislature to set the dates, um, they, we had to, you know, we had discretion, we had flexibility. So this process is still one where, again, local control has been taken away, the mandate for the process is still in place, and we still have mandates requiring bargaining. And I'll tell you, as a parent, I want to have some input. The SAC's input is critical. The SAC's, you know, having a representation on there, talking to the teachers and saying, well, some, I mean, some teachers and, and parents will say, I want a week at Thanksgiving. I don't want as many half days, or I'm okay with some of those half days. Well, I agree, but Thomas, the SAC committees I were on last year, there, there weren't any of those options. It was one day on the either, one or two days on the either, either side of Christmas. Everything else was the same. No, so, you're, you're talking about a completed calendar. I'm talking, I'm talking about, about when the they are, those, there are parents that are in the calendar committee oh, okay, okay, representing right. those conversations. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the SAC committee when they got to vote on the calendar. <laughs> there wasn't any rules. I mean, it was, they were all... No, because they already had representation that was in the committee. Right. Yeah. Why well, do we have every SAC committee has a... No, no, you like have that? parents that right. represent... Right. I just, I mean, that, that was just some comments that I heard from last year that we're, where are our choices? But, you know, it is, we're bound by what the state gives us, what the state mandates us, and I understand that. Now, the other issue is I wanted to get the position on the county fair mm -hmm. and spring break because if I recall, this is a year where the <coughs> fair 
board voted for a year that's not going to fall. It's going to be a testing week. Was that right? Am I remembering that correct? Or is this going to be a year is the problem? The year that we have right now? No, this is next year. Oh, no, no, we're, we're still going to be in 1819. One of them, the fair dates, or was it this? this oh, I have it right here. This is when I'm talking about like, things to think about. The county fair for 2019 is going to be March 25th to the 31st. Right, and was that? It is not going to be during, that's not um, testing. Okay. Right, that's what he was saying. That's right. This I'm, year, I think there was a major conflict, but year, not the coming calendar you're working on. Wasn't this year the, the year the fair changed the week? Mm -hmm. Well, they they signed their contracts early. Right, so we already right. know the dates. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we, I went on their website for the corner or fair people and so, Amy, I think the question is, is 2018 mm -hmm. the year that the fair week and our testing week were in conflict, or was it 2017? That was no, no, well, no, it is during the window. However, it's not going to, we're still going to have enough testing days within it, and it's only affecting, I believe, our retakes. You know, our retakes. So, is the fair week in 2018 coincide with spring break? Yes. It does. Yeah, okay. this year. So it was the 17 year that we they weren't. It was the, right, it was last it, year. It was the 17 year that they couldn't we had a major because they changed vendors. Mm -hmm. The fair changed right. vendors after we had settled the calendar and they had changed their dates. Mm -hmm. right. So nine. Because all of our options last year when we voted had um, had spring break and the county fair during the same. So that's what it was. It was this it was 2017 that was the issue. So this 18, we're, we're good. We're good. We're good on the mm -hmm. fair. But 19, we don't know. Well, that's going to be up for discussion. I mean, that's what we're going to be creating the options regarding. We know when the county fair is in 2019. Right. It's going to be March 25th to the 31st. And so that's going to be, of course, presented to the committee when they are coming up with the different options. Of these are things to keep in mind if possible. But do we know testing week yet? Yes, we do. We have the testing calendar. Mm -hmm. Now that's. But I, mm -hmm. they, I think that's what our board needs to say. They need to say Correct. today that you want that week off and you mm -hmm. want it to coincide with spring break so that when Amy goes to the committee, she can say this is non negotiable. Right. And here's the and thing is, Ms. Nolan, the last slide that I have here is where I do want your board recommendations. And I will, you know, put down what your recommendations are, like you were saying, those non negotiables. And I do have up here in bullets the ones that you have previously um, stated in previous years for. Okay calendar committee but before you know I hear about those I wanted to just kind of give you um, an update that there was a legislation change that will affect our 1819 school year where in House Bill 7069 and this of course will be presented to the um, to the committee as well that testing in 1819 they basically said that the big piece is that all of our computer-based testing which is the majority of our testing is has to be administered within a four-week assessment window that opens no earlier than May 1st. So that would mean May 1st, we would have to have school for four weeks following May 1st to be able to abide by, or even just to get all the testing done that needs to be done. So that is something that is a huge difference than what we have done before. Normally our testing is done by the second week of May. Um, for the most part, our major, you know, big piece of FSA and FCAT. So that is something that is going to first time be implemented in 1819. Um, and so that legislation change is something that is going to, of, of course, affect our school calendar if now we are not able to end school earlier than the last day of May. Um, so that's one thing, and of course our county fair, and then have other testing windows, like our AP testing and our IB testing, which um, again, like you see that IB testing window is going to May 24th in 2019. So again, that is going to the end of year. Um, but in, in the past, we have had times where our IB students actually did have to come in after their graduation, and they walked across the stage and actually come and take an IB test. Um, and they're okay with doing that, but of course, in the best world, we would want them to, of course, complete their um, testing before graduation. But May is going to be one test after another for, for high school in particular. Oh, that absolutely, being, being that they're putting them all in that four week. Mm -hmm. EOTs. FSA. Mm -hmm. FSA. Um, Correct. It's, it's going to be a tough month. Yes. But that is going to be a lot of instruction going on. Because it usually disrupts the day when you have the testing at the, at the high school level. Mm -hmm. 
but they did put it all in one, like I said, in that one month, but it, that is gonna affect our ending date in all of our options when you see that. So when we look at what our previous board recommendations have been before, um, the board previously recommended that Veterans Day be a holiday for both students and staff. Um, you've always asked us to commit to recognizing and accommodating for the Citrus County Fair. I mean, state testing was a priority, but always trying to accommodate that. Um, we, you've recommended before two weeks in December for Christmas break. Um, you've asked to keep in mind opportunity for hurricane makeup days, one week off in November, that being Thanksgiving break. Last year, we added those two bottom recommendations um, based on, I believe, feedback that you heard from schools, administrators, and teachers, saying those pre-planning days for instructional staff when we had the you know more than just I believe we had three to five now making it seven days if possible that you know we really requested that and we did do that and then support staff beginning before students first day was another recommendation from the board so like Ms. Hill was saying like you know these were things that you know were kind of like non-negotiables like she said that I present to the board when we meet next month to say okay when you are creating your calendar option um, keeping these things in mind and then of course we hear from them also what are some you know recommendations that they have heard from their staff and their parents and their staff and so forth and we kind of make a big poster of these things that you all recommend and then of course their recommendations also so that way when the committees are creating theirs they're keeping those things in mind and this year is going to be a little bit more challenging because as the calendar rotates every year mm -hmm. this year we started school on a thursday mm -hmm. so for right. elementary step by step there still was two days before we went to a right. full week right because the Fortunately, says, if you model this current calendar for next year that would mean we start on a friday because the statute says that you cannot start earlier than august 10th right you can't start after august 10th that is isn't that you can't start after august 10th however you can't start earlier and because of our block scheduling we definitely want semester one in the past we've always wanted semester one to end in that december and then start semester two in january and that also is a piece with dual enrollment and all of that as well and so with that being said you want semester one to be as equal to the days as semester two so because of that it's you know there's um you don't really have a lot of extra days in semester one to work with so we've always went to the earliest day we could possibly start which would be august 10th and you're right that would then be a friday next year and, that, and that's that's where that mm -hmm. that calendar flexibility is going to be a challenge I, you know i still believe very strongly in finishing the semester by this by the beginning of the uh the winter break and i don't know how the rest of the board feels but i still think that needs to you know that that has been the expectation but that has not been the previous board's recommendation although i think that was always the expectation i'm not sure we shouldn't just add that but that's that's just one board member's opinion you know i, I totally agree with you it impacts grades and everything else if you draw it out like for two weeks or if you school and if they're doing dual enrollment it really can impact them absolutely so are you wanting to add a recommendation of ending semester one before Christmas break? Yes. You're here. And I don't know how the rest of the board feels. While I love, as a parent, the idea of Thanksgiving break being a week, and we have had to remove, but put a disclosure about hurricane days being possibly made up then. The problem Around is the it's still very early in hurricane season, and, and you know for it to necessarily be impacted uh, it wouldn't be bad to see a calendar we uh, we had a parent last year that tried very hard to have one of the three calendar potential calendars have a shorter thanksgiving week mm -hmm. option so at least the people could consider that as an option where it also tends to help is because we tend to have trying to fit enough days okay. in uh in that first semester so I don't necessarily think it's a board recommendation, but I, I would certainly say that it, it would be interesting, although I'm personally still would rather have the week for Thanksgiving, it would be interesting to see how people vote if that were, If that were another vote. option, is that what you're yeah. saying? No. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I will say that we had one time where, um, and superintendent has done a great job getting hurricane days waived. Yes. But I will tell you, I remember one time when years ago we didn't get it waived. And the only people in our schools on Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week were the teachers. Yes. 
and the parents said, oh, we've already got our plane reservation, so mm -hmm. you have to be very, very careful once you do it. And there was one year, I remember, we, we kept the kids after Memorial Day into June, and there was nobody there. They came and they took their exams, but they did not come back to classes after Memorial Day, so we, we've, we've really trained. A, it's really a makeup day on paper. Yeah, it's it is. It's instructions. And, and the only thing I would add about if we had the Monday and Tuesday in school, his parents knew those were school days, if we had to have a calendar like that, and they may not make the plans, but you're right, once the plans are made, mm -hmm. they're yeah. done. Their plans are made. They're done. Scott? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, um, it's not early in the hurricane season. It's actually, the hurricane season ends December 1. So it's at so, the end of hurricane season. So it, there is some flexibility there. I mean, I'm thinking of like no name storm. We had some right. things that were later in the, the year when we needed to do make. Well, last year, didn't we have makeup day? We we were running a risk of makeup day last year because it was it, because they had the storm problems were far after when we would have been able to you know take that day. But you're right. But are we saying that we're going to leave that flexible? I think we should leave it up to the calendar committees to, to, to decide about that. But it would be curious to see. So you're saying remove the I don't think it's going to win, by the way. I, the, uh, the truth is, I don't think that calendar will win enough votes right. to ever be recommended as the calendar to mm -hmm. have. But sure you're saying for the board to rec like to remove that as one of your board non-negotiables. No, no, no. I, I would oh. Say that. But, oh, yeah, I would remove yeah, that. Okay, I'm that's sorry. what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, again, I would say I'm still for the idea of it. Right. But or even just have one option that didn't include. Uh, right, but I mean, you're so when we say it's a non-negotiable, that means right. that it's something that needs to be on all three calendars. Right. So if you want to remove, if you want it to be an option, then we're removing it as a yeah. non-negotiable from the yeah. board. Okay. I'll remove it. Got it. Okay. Now, uh, just to clarify, because I've got this year's calendar, that my handy little. But uh so our last day of school in this school year is May the twenty fourth. Now, according to that testing window, the four weeks testing window, not to begin before May one, does that mean that we cannot that, that the earliest last day of school would be the twenty eighth? The 28th of May. Right, because that's the last Friday. They would need to, students would need to be in school for four weeks after May 1st. Mm -hmm. So, four <laughs> weeks is 28 days. Right. So that means the last day of school, the earliest it could be is May 28th. Or June 1st. Or, okay. Or, right. Whatever. So earliest it could be. Mm -hmm. And right. I think you've got graduations in there and everything like that as well. You're correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Yeah. Well, some of our old calendars can't had the kids come back and do their exams after Memorial Day, and that worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Memorial so to come back to classes doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. Wow. And in this in this calendar for 18 Memorial Day is the 28th of May. What did you take off? No. Well, it's this, we're day. set on this calendar. I'm <laughs> bringing on. Golly. Well, all right. Are holidays part of the school calendar? <laughs> that would be the time. Well, Veterans Day. I yeah. mean, days that we take off, definitely. You know, I mean, not all of them are um, required. So, the previous board recommendations, is, is there any other ones besides the one week off in November that you are wanting to remove as a non negotiable? I'd just like to add a comment about our Thanksgiving discussion. Okay. If we needed those two days on Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week, to make sure that we ended before Christmas break, the semester one, I think that would be important to have those days there. You know, because we have yeah. tried to equalize the first semester, second semester. I agree. Right. And those are two days that we can continue to play with. Um, and as long as we've given them enough notice uh, that there's uh, those are school days, then they can make their plans accordingly. But I, I, I really like to see that semester end in December. And so well, that I have made as a as a non-negotiable yeah. starting yeah. in semester one before Christmas break. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think removing that mandate at least provides that flexibility. Okay. Any other recommendations? You okay. do an amazing job, and it is always exciting to watch that process. It really is.
I mean, they're a good group of people. Yeah, and We've got quite a few. Right? And the teachers, you know, they were only talking about a half day here or a day there, but, but they appreciate the input. And sometimes that one day is, is important to them. They do discuss it. And the calendar rep is all over the teachers. So uh, this is one place where they do have a little bit of a voice. Yes. They get a little squeaky voice, but they do have a voice. And it's really don't have a choice. Yeah, it's a very important day. It's a very important day. Want to make it verbal? I don't like <laughs> Well, I always made the recommendation as a teacher that we should never have to have classes on a full moon day, but, but that, <laughs> never, that never made it to the calendar. Or an eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> or an eclipse, yeah. I forgot about the eclipse. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. I need it. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Health insurance fund update and renewal information. Good morning. Good morning. I would just like to mention to you that this is a process, the renewal process that we go through annually. And we do have with us today Brian Branham from Crown. And he's an important part of our process. We meet together for renewal meetings to come to this point. Um, this year it was Brian, myself, and Mr. Walker. And we also have Kim Van Atten with us, who is our employee benefits specialist. So she's in here with us today as well. Another part of this process that's very important is that we get input from our health insurance committee. So we met with the health insurance committee and shared this information with them and gathered input and had discussion on August 15th. And Mrs. Bryant was there. She's your board representative on our health insurance committee. So that has brought us to where we are today. So I'm gonna kind of jump right in. First, we're gonna do the fund update, which is the second quarter fund update. And um, I'd like to give you an overview of where we're at with claims. So we'll do the fund update first, and then we'll go into um, renewal information and what we're looking at for 2018. So if you look at the claims data, shows you 2014, 2015, 2016, and then where we're at so far in 2017. I will share with you that we just got the information for July claims, and we were pleased um, for July claims. We're at 940,000. So we have had a good June and July as far as claims. Yes, yes. And then at the bottom you'll see the total claims for 2014, 15, 16, and then where, where we are so far for 2017. The asterisk, I'll remind you, for the 2016 column is because we got part of that back in reimbursements. That is not reflected on this slide that we've got. Uh, one second. I would just like to publicly say that I know that Sherry and her team went out to the schools to educate our staff about when we're self-funded and, and those types of things because I don't believe a lot of them knew and understood the whole process and the plan. And they also did a um, great job on explaining to them how important it was to use the, the Care Here Center. And we had several of our staff members going out to other doctors and those types of things which we still promote. But, you know, starting at the care center. So I think some of our decreases in, you know, that's probably I'm not talking too soon for August, but um, I think some of our decreases in our claims has been because you all went out and did that. So you did a nice job. Thank you. Um, I do think the education was an important piece. Um, and Mr. Bishop helped us with that. Mr. Baumer helped us with that. Um, so it was a team effort. Also, the expansion of the Health Insurance Committee. We made sure at the Health Insurance Committee meeting that we um, expressed our appreciation to them. I think they've been integral as, as well and we on helping educate. We expanded yes. it. We expanded it. We have one from every site and every um, district department. And those folks are taking information back and encouraging our employees and helping educate our employees. So I do think that combination has been helpful. Just to give you a bit of a breakdown here, it just shows you that those are the same totals, of course, January through June, and it shows you the medical and the pharmacy, really just to show you how much of the claims dollars each month is pharmacy expense. That's not the pharmacy from the wellness center, that's pharmacy claims when they go to CVS or Walgreens. Is the pharmacy at the wellness center in medical? 
Yes, that's reflected in a different line on it. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that. <coughs> okay, that'll be a line item with the wellness center expenses on another slide. Okay, thank you. These medical claims are not wellness center, it's outside providers. Okay. These pharmacy claims are not wellness center. Okay, these are our monthly averages. When you look at January through June for the four years, that is what we've been averaging per month. So you'll see that we did have a big, a fairly big jump from 14 to 15. And that's when we had our really hard renewal last year to try to help um, compensate for that. But, but you'll see we are leveling off. Um, as, and again, the annual average for 2016 doesn't reflect the Symmetra reimbursement. But you'll see that with our claims trend, we're going along pretty well. Thank goodness that we're, we're going pretty well with that because we're in a mode right now that we're ne needing to build our reserves. Was 24, I'm sorry, was 14 to 15 where ACA really kicked in? We had some large fees at that point in time with the transitional reinsurance fee. Yes. So that that's that was a factor. Also, and that's going to be another slide that comes up, that is another factor is having to meet that mandate, but then the migration to the plan that we're required to offer. These are our six months totals. When you look at six months for the four years, that what we totaled in a six month period of time. So again, last year um, was a tougher year than we had become accustomed to. As far as our renewal, we had to make plan changes. We had some um, increase in our premiums a little bit heavier than what we had become accustomed to, but you'll see that is paying off. Um, that was the plan to build our revenue. That's what we needed to do. Our claims are fairly, they're trending fairly well. We needed to build the revenue. So by doing that, we were averaging in 2016 1.150 in revenue per month, and now we're averaging 1.4 in revenue per month. So a significant increase in revenue per month to help us with our fund hopefully to not have to borrow from the general fund or to use from the general fund and hopefully um, to be able to you know continue along this path so you've already seen this this was the quarterly update from last quarter so i'm going to go ahead and look at the second quarter the fund update for the second quarter which is slide eight so just to remind you that first column is what we budget for what we anticipate to happen each month and then you'll see april may and june and this is just capturing a month at a glance what actually happened in april may and june so we'll just go down the april line when you're looking at the premiums we had budgeted 1.365 we were pretty on target there a little low in april the other revenue that comes in would be Department of Transportation, our, our transportation department pays us back for physicals that are done there. The larger one that you see in June, remember we occasionally get some pharmacy rebates back. So that was our total revenues for those three months at a glance. Expenses, those are the claims expenses, what we budget for compared to what we actually had in April, May, and June. Our Florida Blue admin fees, the reinsurance premium that we pay to Symmetra, the care here fees, that is for program fees, service fees, and pharmacies. So that's the line where you see pharmacy expenses from the wellness center. The wellness center other, those are things such as supplies, rent, you'll see in June, it's, it's slightly higher, it is higher, that's because of the rent. We pay the rent twice a year, <coughs> so that'll show up on two different months. Those then, expenses are after we've split with like the sheriff's department and all of that's been reconciled and set Yes, up. the care here fees are after reconciliation. The other fees, um, for example, the rent, we pay the rent in Beverly Hills, they pay the rent in Inverness. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the totals, the net, and then we, we plan for aggregate specific pooling. We have not had to use that at this point in time, but we plan for that in case we hit that reinsurance mark with any of our claimants. So that gives you the monthly surplus. So again, that's just a month at a glance. When I total up that bottom line for all six months, we, we're sitting at from January through June at 1.5. And that's not considering, again, that we haven't had to use the aggregate specific pooling. Our actual fund balance at the end of June is at approximately 2 million right now. 
which is healthy, which is good. Um, again, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We know that typically July through December claims will be higher, um, but, but we are trending along very well at this point in time. But our July claims are lower. Yes. So, yeah, we are pleased with July claims. June and July were good this year. Hoping everybody's not saving things for August. So, but, but it is. They, they cover the, the cost of the Wellness Center in Inverness. We cover the cost of Beverly Hills. But then we track physician hours. We track pharmaceuticals. We track the use of the x-rays. And it's billed out and split according to the use, who used it. They would pay their percentage of, of what they would pay their actual dollar that they spent there. We bill it out, we split out the bill. Okay. This is sheriff's usage, this is our usage, they pay for theirs, we pay for ours. Except and there's more of us than there are of them. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Again, there's this is just a reminder of recent factors. Again, the toughest um, expense here was from 14 to 15, and that's when, at this time last year, we were needing to make up for that. And just to remind you the things that were affecting our plan that have leveled out somewhat at this point in time, but the, high, the increase in medical expenses, increase in pharmacy expenses, we had several extremely high claimants that hit the plan. The Affordable Care Act, we have those fees. We have the mandated plan changes and the member migration and then the actuarial requirements. As far as the mandated plan changes, that really is tying our hands, and you'll see that in a later slide as well, that we are forced to offer this. By law, we have to offer this plan, and they give us a cap on what we can charge in premium, and again, that's why we made that difficult decision last year that those folks can't use the wellness center. They're not, they're not supporting, they're not helping support the wellness center. So those are just a little historical on, on how we got to where we are today. As far as this slide, the green line in front, those are our actual expenses. So those are true numbers and it's a projection for 2017. And you'll see where we are trending pretty well as far as our claims. That, that dollar amount reflects our claims plus the amount of money it costs us to run the wellness center. The back line is showing you, had we stayed back in 2009, had we stayed fully insured, had we been going along claims only at an, an average of what claims go up nationally, that is where we would be at this point in time, potentially, if we were fully insured, that would be what our claims expense would be at this point in time. So does, you, that, does that, just a question, <laughs> does, does that include not having the wellness center? <laughs> that would be on the back line if we didn't have a wellness center okay. and we were paying all our claims to private folks. Got it. And then the front line is where our claims and the running of our wellness center, that's the actual dollar where we're at. So we obviously made a good decision. We just have to continue to manage the, the plan well. Can you talk with someone uh, in government who talk about um, medical situations? They, they say that we're going to go to a one payer. I don't feel like I can speak to that. I don't know if anyone else is comfortable speaking to that. Okay, could you repeat the question? Maybe, can you get your mic? Uh, the institution of single payer system. Mm -hmm. Affect the wellness. <laughs> How does a single payer? How would it? Yeah. Um, it's not there yet. And, and uh, people I know who run hospitals and say, it's, I mean, you know, that's what's going to happen. You still uh, got a single payer, obviously, your your dollars, you know, having to fund for health insurance. So, really, it would be a, a it would just be a benefit for the employees to, because they would still need to have somewhere to go. It's just that you're now not paying for the paying for the, it would just be a direct expense, a cost for the for the district to have a health center. Because you're not now having to pay for health insurance if you went to a single payer. It would all government. Yeah, it would be all government. <coughs> but how would the wellness center figure 
Well, I mean, you could still have the health center. You could still have a, but again, it would just be a direct expense. Um, you're not, in, you're, you're, you're not having it to impact the claims for revenue <coughs> in, in your budgets today, like you are today. You would be more of a benefit. It. Who's paying it? Direct expense. For the clinic now? No. If we go to the same <coughs> oh, if, you, if you elected to have the health center still, you would still pay for it. Uh, the government. Oh, well, I thought, was, were you talking about single payer single system payer. and government? Is yeah. that going to be, we, we, it'd be a benefit like Social Security, but everyone, it'd be fin exactly. financed by taxes? Is that socialized medicine? It would be a Medicare system for everyone. Mm -hmm. is what it's exactly. basically a, a, yeah. a, it would be like a Medicare system. Who came up with this crazy you idea? Get, and then there's, there's <laughs> positives and negatives <laughs> too. <laughs> right. No, I asked because every time I, I talk with someone who runs a hospital, a friend of mine, uh -huh. um, that's what they say. Mm. And you can already see the 2020 politics. They're already, um, you know, talk, you know, they're already talking about it again. So you're, you're right. It's going to be pushed. <coughs> comes to fruition or not? It is, uh, and for for people, for our employees and things like that, the challenge is. Would a single payer system have any more or less benefits than what they they currently have under our system? Those will be the things I'm saying people will have to debate. And then will it be more or less the premium costs? Um, and that's what I don't think anyone really has. There's a lot of fun, there's a lot of ideas and, and but we don't concerns, know. but nobody knows. Nobody, no, nobody knows right now. I mean, I mean, if you to look at the ACA, Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. Um, really have, you know, the idea of, oh, it's not going to cost you anymore, <clears throat> you know, that hasn't worked out at all. You've seen quite the opposite. That's true. You've seen, you know, how many states where the carriers, are, you're down to one carrier, so there's, it, it really hasn't worked. And I think, personally, that it was set up that way to fail, so that to your point, the agenda is to push the single payer. Here's someone told me that the very same thing uh, is in charge of a hospital. Is it, it's all set up to fail. Mm -hmm. We're going to the single payer because everything's being done right now. It's not going to work. Yeah. And, and, you know, taking uh, taking it out of, out of your hands, uh, controlling your hands and putting it in federal government's hand isn't going to change anything. They're, you're not changing. The system is broken. It goes from bad to worse. So, so it's in my mind. It will be even worse. Mm -hmm. um, what you've done, you you went self-funded. You're you're controlling your costs. You put the health center in. You're doing these things to help control your costs. When that's gone, your costs will rise. Oh, well, sure. well, your taxes. <laughs> four years. Your taxes are gonna for sure. I mean, who's gonna pay for it? I mean, right now it's so adversely selected against the a ACA is now. That's why you see these plans jumping out because the healthy folks aren't taking it. It's the, it's the sick one, so so. And that impacts the cost of the pharmaceutical costs continue to balloon. Oh, and that that is in and of itself could be just one area there. that needs to be controlled because well, as you you've seen our yeah you're. Your uh, pharmacies right now through seven months is 29 percent of your total spend. So we're, we're we're talking about things to look outside the box to, to save on pharmacy because it will be and it continues to be an issue. Um, you know, depending on what you what you read, um, you know, specialty drugs will be become more than half of your spend on your on your pharmacy. That's a, an area that the uh, wellness center really, I feel, focus on and they make a huge difference because I talk to Lori that, that many of the medicines taken are taken for hypertension and sure. all these kind of things that are lifestyle or work related, maybe they're nervous, <laughs> you know, and the teaching you're doing. And all of those things and interventions can be lessened. Uh, and therefore, the need for the drugs lessons. So I think the care center can have a very big impact. Oh, sure. 
uh, when, before you started uh, in, in 2010 with the health center, you were you had over 40,000 medications that were running through the Florida Blue Plan. Today it's 24,000. That's the number of scripts that run through. What's difficult is, uh, you know, we have transitioned a lot of, of, of those chronic medications, hypertension, di you know, those, those types of medications, to the health center at a, at a very low cost. The problem happens is when you get a specialty drug come through, like a Harboni or a Savaldi, or, or there's, a, there's cancer drugs that are very expensive. You know, a, a, you know Savaldi or Harboni is going to hit the plan for about 100 grand for one full script. It's about an 88 day treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to replace a lot of uh, low cost. The, the frequency of that, trying to overcome a hundred thousand dollar one-time expense, is very difficult to do. So that's part of the part of the reasons what we're looking outside the box to help control those specialty costs, because that's that's the big driver right now. And the education that Ms. Stern and she did, that Ms. Hemel, you talked about at the beginning, that really does play a, a significant role in educating our members and our you know our to be able to use the wellness center in a way that positively impacts their life and ultimately positively impacts those uh, those reimbursables yeah. in such a way that it keeps our costs down. It's a big connection between what they do and how it right. affects the And sometimes you just don't think of it. Right. One of the things that I, I've said this to Ms. Chernich that we've we have got to help get across this is not the school board's insurance company. This is our school employee's insurance company. We're self-insured, but this is each one of them are the benefits and the payers of this system. It exists only because as a benefit to them. We could very easily have just gone to another, you know, uh, insurance company and just, you know, had contracted it out and we would have you know been paying we see you know 20 something percent more uh, in premiums we do this as a benefit to try and keep those costs down and provide that but this is really their insurance company and that's why that education I think is so important to say you there is a direct you know financial benefit to them by better understanding how the insurance company works and you have a very good point because if you don't have to spend money on this sort of thing, you can spend the money on other things Absolutely. that benefit the teachers and the students. Absolutely. So it's really a win win situation if you work together <laughs> to make it happen. All right, I'll move along. Thank you. <clears throat> So last year, we know we did have, um, this time last year was a tough renewal year. Um, this year is not nearly. Um, we're in much better position right now than we were at this time last year. We are looking at potentially an 8 to 10% increase in premiums. Um, fortunately, because our claims are running quite well and pretty much within budget or under budget at this point in time, we are able to stay um, in the single digits. When we went into this meeting with Brian, we went into the meeting thinking we would need to do probably a 10% increase plan in, in the premiums. However, we met, we looked at the numbers, and we're pretty comfortable at this point in time that it'll be the 8%. I've got both of these in this PowerPoint because we're still ironing out some last minute numbers that have come in. But potentially, I think we are looking at an 8% increase. And this is, I'm reminding our staff members that this we're still in the mode that we need to build our reserves. We need to make our plan healthy. Fortunately, we worked really hard to not have to make any plan changes, so I'm pleased that we don't have to do that this year. We went many years with no plan changes. Last year, um, we had the premium increases and the plan changes, so it was a priority and we were trying really hard to not have to do that and make the plan changes. When I met with the Health Insurance Committee, I did talk to them about plan changes and premium increases, and they liked the idea of trying to not make plan changes as well. So as I go and I, as you look at these, if I could just point out in 2017, I don't really have a figure as to our, our premiums went up X number of percent. What happened in 2017 is we needed to increase our revenue by 23%. 
But when we went to that first meeting and we looked at that, we kind of looked at each other at the table and said, we don't want to tell everybody their premiums are going up 23% each. What else can we do? And that's when we started making <clears throat> some difficult decisions as far as plan changes, um, 5172 no longer having access to the wellness center. We did those types of modifications so that we didn't have an across the board 23% increase. So um, that's kind of a little bit of an explanation as to the 2017. So but for, what do you think the premium increase was? If it wasn't? As you know, um, as you know, we it was not across the board. Remember, we had plans A, B, C, and D, and we configured it different ways. The one we landed on was as minimal an increase as we could for the single employees, the 1,100 people, or, or 1,100 people that were on the most popular plan. The 5168. So we tried to have the least impact on them. The employee plus one plan was costing the plan more, so those premiums went up more than a family plan or a single plan. So it, it's hard. There's I can't really average that out. It was it was so all over the place. All right. Um, to get the premium to get the pot of money up by 23 percent our revenue. And a reminder, and this is something that. I reminded at the health insurance committee as well is that yes last year was a difficult year but the board and mrs himmel um, worked really hard and were very generous in increasing the board match to offset that and so it went up eighty dollars last year which is you know pretty unheard of as you all know as far as yes. increasing the board match per month so even though it was a difficult year it was help and compensated and i also remind them that we have not had to use any money from the general fund up until 2015. In 2015, we had to um, have a transfer of 800,000 from the general fund. In 2016, we had to have 600,000 from the general fund. We don't want to continue to do that. We don't want to have to do that. Um, we're very hopeful when the actuary report comes out that we're not going to have to continue that, but we need to wait, of course, until the end of the year and we have that report. But that's what we're planning for. We're trying to build that reserve and make our plan sound again and it's not a quick one-year fix it's a three-year plan and we're in year two we're looking at an eight percent increase um, we're hoping that year three you know it's too too early to predict but we're hoping it'll be a better year premium increase wise one thing i am reminding and i asked the health insurance committee to help with this at the sites <coughs> is that when i'm saying it's not as bad a year with our premium increases, those that are on the single plan are gonna say, what do you mean, it's more out of my pocket. Because we offset so much of it last year with the $80 board increase, the single plan only went up by a dollar or two for those folks. So this year they are going to, to have an increase in their plan, not as great as last year's, but out of their own pocket, mm -hmm. it will be greater because highly unlikely a board match like that again. Um, so when you, you know, look at what the board match will probably be, that's something we need to prepare our employees for. So again, these are our three plans, and fortunately we're not planning to make any plan changes. We're not going to have to increase the deductibles or the out-of-pockets. I do remind staff that we have a very rich plan. We've had new employees come to us, and they look at what we offer them, and they're very pleased with our fairly low deductibles and fairly low maximum out of pockets. So our plan is still rich, it's still very comparable to what's out there. Last year, even with the plan changes and the increases, we did not have that much migration off of our plan. Our numbers stayed fairly solid, which was, was good. They went out there, they looked around, and they saw that it is still a very good, rich plan. So just what does this mean? What does it look like dollar-wise? These are our current 2017 rates. And then the next slide, um, page 15. If you just want to maybe focus on the last two columns. Well, let me, let me back up. I'm sorry. Look at the first column. The total plan cost per month. That is what went up 8%. So if the board match were to stay the same, this is what the employee cost per month would be and then and the employee cost per pay. And then if you want to, and that's kind of the bottom line, what, what employees will look at is how much is it more is coming out of each paycheck. So the last two columns, the far right is what's currently coming out of their paycheck, 
And then the last column of the chart is what will come out of their paycheck with an 8% increase, with no increase in board match. That'll be negotiated as to whether there's, you know, perhaps a board board match increase. Um, Mr. Blocker. Yes, sir. How much more did the legislature uh, give us to be able to fund the increases in health insurance? A lot. Uh, our total funding increase was approximately one percent, but as you know, that was about uh, a million dollars. So, in fact, we are still paying from last year's health insurance increase about seven hundred thousand, plus FRS increase about three hundred thousand. So. Really, they didn't give us anything. So we're just staying status quo where they gave us last year. So in order for us to have to cover the costs increased by, again, just the operations of having to have an, an, a health insurance, we're going to probably have to look at modifying our budgets in other areas. Creating efficiencies to be able to create a surplus. That was a really nice way you said it. <laughs> yeah, always does. There's, oh, yeah, it's good. Unfortunately, that also means that there there could end up having to be adjustments that that can impact, and and that's what I say. Why, when I say this is not just the school districts, um, you know, insurance plan, it affects all of us. It's going to further infect our classrooms. It's going to further uh, impact our teachers, you know, bottom line that they're taking home, our custodians, what they're bringing home. And those are the realities that, again, the more we can educate, the more they can understand of that. Mm -hmm. And that's why some people, they sit there and go, I just can't afford to have health insurance and I'll take the penalty. Because it's, you know, they're not paying tax, you know, they're, they're, they're making a limited amount, but they're not paying much of the tax, maybe anyway. So. And that doesn't necessarily help the overall system when that happens. And education is key. I'll be going out to every site beginning mid-September and going over these renew the renewal information, but also educating. You know that we're self-insured, that it's their plan, that we all need to work together to help keep things at a good rate. And I do think we have to again marry up what increase because we are still having told out there that there are record-funded. Uh, historical levels of educational funding and the reality is they're speaking in a very different terminology where they're also not including the number of increased students which uh, I know we haven't talked about yet but we've had a significant increased number of students and some of that I know we'll get back in in some adjustments but there's a lot of costs that we have to build in that we're not going to get reimbursed uh, for. Always remember there's a correlation between increase in students and increase in teachers so right the money you get back in the increase goes out in the increase in teachers out so there is a and our hope is that it can cover it <laughs> correct yeah so one of the things we have to be careful on though is that if we use this eight to ten percent increase in premiums and yet you look at certain groups that are looking at a lot more percentage wise than eight to ten percent Got to make sure people, we, we're not here to right say 8 to 10 percent, and then when it comes time for them to pay their premiums, it's up 20 percent. So I would just caution, I mean, we got to be careful because we don't want to mislead people. And I'm not, I know this is bargaining, or, or not bargaining, but it's going to be negotiated or looked at, and we might need to go into a shade session to be able to talk about that. I don't know when the right time for that's going to be. But I certainly hate passing on a huge percentage increase to the largest number of participants in a plan. Um, you know, I, I think we need to have some discussion on that, on how we can, you know, keep people from having to hit a 20% or 15. I, you know, those are things that we need to talk about. Now, I did mention on the, uh, I know Ms. Sarnich, you talked about not changing the, the plans mm -hmm. and you know we have through bids and looking at options for providers we've stayed with Blue Cross which needs to be the message needs to be reminded or said people need to be reminded that's a pretty good company it's good that we're not changing that because if we were to change that in light of still having to raise premiums 
you know, that would really make people feel upset, I think, to know that their providers are going to change and we have to do a big change. So we're looking out for the best interest of our employees and that's our goal. And, you know, when you look at it, a lot of it comes down to how we present it and you've done a good job and how we educate people on using the wellness center and all those things. But this is big business. This is a lot of money that we're talking about. And Brian, you know my, I, I, the board's feelings is we got to make sure we're watching this, that we're saving as much money as we can, and there's no waste here, that we're trying to cut waste, we're trying to make sure our participants are using the plan wisely, and we're saving money where we can save money. Now, one of those options would be to increase the, the out-of-pocket maximums on the, the 5168 plan, and, um, you know, I, I talked to Ms. Cernich, we had a very good conversation. I know there's probably not a lot of savings there, but why, um, why could that not be an option? I didn't have opportunity after you and I spoke to speak to Brian about that. Uh, about a year, and uh, it was about 15 months ago, and Mr. Bishop and Sherry and myself, and uh, we've you had, can step up to the mic so they can hear you. We sat in a room and, um, you know, looking at the revenue. This was a revenue discussion more than it is a claims discussion. And you are correct in, in your in the way that it is presented. It is a we're talking an overall revenue of eight percent. Yes, from a percentage basis, depending on what the board matches and and the, the premium calculations. It, it can it it will be more than in some territory or in some groups be more. You are correct. But when we when we sat down in the room, we we're looking at a, a revenue. What do we need in revenue to basically turn the ship around and then make it sound so that uh, we're not coming back and have to say, well, we need eight hundred thousand or we need six hundred. So we put together a three year plan. Yes, two thousand seventeen. Big, big increase. This year, we're actually running a little bit better than, than projected. At, we had 10% in our, in our number when we built the model. And then 2000, for 2019, we have 8% um, built in. So we built it out to get to where the plan is actually, will stand on its own. So that when the claim seasons come, when we have a tough year, which they will, um, we can weather that with the with the extra reserve dollars that we have so we have to build that up and that that's the overall goal and to sherry's point and, and to and to ken and others that are educating um, the the population to understand that we're self-funded i mean you know when we have a, our deductible satisfied doesn't mean that we're off the hook the plan is still paying and, and that's that's a common misconception out there in Europe. but but overall um, when you when you make a, a, a deductible change or, or out of pocket we're gonna we're gonna get I, I don't want to make a deductible change. Uh, I'm sorry out of pocket so if we if we were to increase the out of pocket let's say we get one percent credit off of our fund off of our um, factors is what we call it our aggregate factors that we use to calculate the premium we might get one percent. So if, if our numbers are based on our claims are going to be 12 million, we're, we're, let's say we expect claims to be 12 million, we're only going to get $120,000 credit off of that. Brian, may I intervene a minute? I was involved in a lot of those conversations last year and we asked the same question, what if we do the out of pocket? And he went through a couple of scenarios where if we increase it and increase some of them significantly, there was not a big increase in the fund in our, in our dollars that we were bringing in. I agree with Doug because we had that conversation last year. Sherry, we don't go out and tell the employees, or do we, that we're increasing you 8%. I mean, don't we give them individuals and what every plan will be in addition to? Because every plan is not 8%, it's an average. And I show them this chart, and I show them that the first column, that's what's going up 8%. And yes, you're correct, Mrs. Hemmel, that it all depends on what the board match would go up. And so it doesn't mean it's an 8% out of their pocket. So the first column is what it would go to for this current, for the upcoming year, correct? Yes, and that's... And the next plan is what we currently show in board match. Mm -hmm. And if that increases, then that number would increase. And then, um, because everybody's sitting there looking at their individual plans and trying to figure out 
And I agree with Mr. Dodd. You know, when you tell me 8% in last year, 20, what we hit last year? 23. Yeah, well, my plan went up probably 30, 35% right. yes. after I came off the ceiling. But, um, but that is a misconception to employees because that I would take as an employee what I'm paying that 8% of that, and that may not be my new payment. So, if, if okay. I may, Go ahead. I think what you got to look at in totality is you're trying to build the revenue right. by 8%. Right. The total revenue that's generated to cover the expenses. And when you're sitting there playing with the migration of numbers in each individual plan, Correct. those individual plans may not be 8% increase, it may be 15, maybe 20, to generate the numbers sufficient enough to cover the expenses that are going up what we plan on as 8%. So then my suggestion it's, it's would how be you kind of phrase the if you were going to show this slide to the employees, my suggestion would be, and it's up to the board also. Health insurance rate, parentheses, 8% increase to the fund. Okay, right. yes. Because when you say health insurance rates, 8% increase, I'm like everybody else, I'm reading 8%, but if you see to the fund, they may not know what that means, but we can certainly explain that to them. Yes, I can do that. Okay. Agree for mm -hmm. yeah. Can I mention also on the 5172 that because of the ACA guideline, that one can't go up 8%. It would be above the limit they give us. So unfortunately, I'm capped at how much I can go up for that one, and the rest of the plan is well, the other making up for it. A4. Yes. Right. The difference at that point. Right. Right. We have yes. To subsidize the, the premium on the other side because we can't exceed uh, this year over uh, will be 9.69 percent of the. Pay. Of the lowest paid right. full time employees, is that right? That's or correct. That's, that's correct. how much you 30 hour. That's 9.69% uh, for this for this year, or a PEMI. Right. So when the calculation is made, uh, depending on board match and so forth, we won't be able to exceed. And um, Sherry was got with uh, uh, the, um, James Crook at CBG, and, and that right now that dollar amount is just, uh, just right at $97. Right, that's the most most that we can do on that one. Which has no bearing to whatever the cost increases. That, that's, that is an arbitrary number based on the percentage that we're given by the federal government uh, yeah. that it can't exceed any more well, than. You, you, you can charge more. It's just then when the plan gets tested, you won't meet affordability. And then if, a, if, an, employee, if an employee says, you know what, I'm going to go to the exchange, and get a, uh, get credit, then they get a subsidy. Then then CMS comes to you uh, and says, "Hey, we have uh, an employee that's got right, and they're going to hit you with the penalty." Mm -hmm. So, for every person that that does that, you're going to get hit with a penalty. So, do you want to do that or not? Our plan would not be meeting the mandate, and we'd be subject to penalty. This is what it would be if it's 10%, but we are feeling comfortable that when I come to you in two weeks for an approval, that we'll be looking at the 8%. That's, we're very hopeful for that. Ms. Horton, one more thing, and I've looked at this with you several times, so I apologize for this one. Is okay. there a column for the board member's benefit, or can you tell them or send them, if I'm on plan 3359 what my premium would go to and I know about the board match but if I'm paying 852 this year what did I pay last year and then the, but they and I, they'll understand but that number would go down if we increase the board match okay I'm not understanding what I don't see 852 that. anywhere on this thing you're talking about 5168 well I've said 3359 single but 5168-660.20 <laughs> <coughs> I don't know. There we go. No, that's, eight that's percent right. slide. Okay, eight percent. That is okay. That's what the premium is. Yes. So if, I, if I'm on fifty-one sixty-eight single, yes. and I pay at six sixty-four for the coming school year, correct? Yes. What did I pay? That what am I currently? Your your increase is thirty-six percent increase. That's what I'm saying. That's a thirty. Your employee cost per month is going from one thirty-five to one eighty-four twenty. That's thirty-six percent. Now, we haven't looked at a board match yet, how much we're going to increase the board match by, so that'll eventually drop. But if we weren't, if we did not increase the board match, that 
5168 group is going to have a 36.4% increase in um, employee costs. Do you see what we're looking at? So yeah. I didn't understand exactly what I was trying to show. This is currently what we pay, this is what we would pay. Oh, I didn't read the top, sorry. So that's okay. But you're correct. So we kind yeah. of have to do this backwards because of how negotiations are set. So we got to show right. the full amount, and then we go back. And you go back, and, back and, right. and we talk about renegotiation. Right. right. And see, the part that I that that kind of concerns me is once we give the board match, it's going to be hard to take that away. It, it was we probably can't take it away. Right. So what my mindset is: how do we make it? where it's not as costing us as much in premiums. And that's why I brought up the max amount of pocket, even though you're we're talking about a very small amount, I guess it's not gonna help us that much. But what I'm trying to do is come up with ways that we can lower the premium so we don't have to increase the board max so much. Right, well, um, and really it's, it's, the, it's the plan that we're putting forth, right? To get the plan to stand on its own. When you have three, four, five million dollars in reserve, and we need, oh, we need 8% or 9% to cover the claims cost for the next year, well, then you can look into that reserve, to dip into that reserve and say, okay, well, maybe we only need four. We'll let the reserve absorb the other five. That, that, and that's the, that's the overall plan that's to goal. get to that. Once we get the reserves to that point. Though. Right, and, 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 and right now, you, you, you know, can't say that we're oh we can do a three percent or four percent increase because with the migration with the way the it, it, it won't work because so we don't have any reserves right now to offset with is that is that kind of what you're telling us well, right now the reserves aren't high enough to they're not high enough all right so right now based on our our projections that we did when we set out that three-year plan we are actually meet actually above that goal we're meeting the goal and exceeding it right now because you're having a good claims year so far this year. And I, and I tell Sherry, I, I hate talking about the claims, but I always <laughs> teach it, something comes up. <laughs> but we are we are having uh, a positive uh, look on claims through seven months of 2017 right now. Um, you know, it's less than where we were last year, <coughs> which is a good thing. Um, but again, it, it, it comes, it's a revenue. Uh, we're trying to build that that reserve up so that the board match discussion is less or none, or or, or you're not adding any more to it, and and you're able to to pull upon those reserve dollars when you have it to help absorb the the dollars that we, that that you need from a revenue perspective. Out of our near 2,200 employees in the district, how many are on our insurance? We have 1680 on, on a plan. So there's roughly five, 600 that are not. And that also becomes always a question that comes up regularly of those five, 600 that when we talk board match too, that they receive nothing. And that's a that's a that's a comment that I hear on a regular basis. Every time you give it to them, we get nothing. And you're paying monthly a benefit to the employees that we also don't benefit from. Granted, the you know the two thirds of the uh, of the staff does, but so that's a that's an issue that continues to float out yep. there whenever we talk about board match. And so I always caution us that in. And that's, that's on all sides of that issue. Whether you're on the bargaining team on one side or the bargaining team on another, remember there that's an impact that, that has to be you know, considered because there's a lot of people that say, you're just, that's just money I'm not getting any value for. So when you talk about it, that's just money out of my pocket. So that's always a subject of negotiations to balance out raises and you know, salary increase versus Board match it, increase. It, it is. It's it is always a, a and it's a hard question. It's not one that I think is easy to answer. Well, then they need to they need to join our insurance group. That's what they need to do. Well, but some of them they, they have you know they they have spouses that have plans that are being paid for. Other ones have military. Yep. Yep. Um, I, you know, for the longest time, I never had insurance through us because I was paying for it elsewhere. There there was a lady that was part of the health group. It was so thankful her husband was in the military. 
Yeah. <laughs> because she's got his insurance. And I said, you thank him for his service. <laughs> and so she did. So, yeah. Well, I can give you an idea on our timeline where we're at at this point in time. We did meet with the Health Insurance Committee. I've had opportunity, um, Mr. Walker has had me on the agenda and I've spoken to the Teamsters as well as CCEA, kind of caught them up on where we're at in our process. Good. Board workshop, then we'll have, um, I'll bring it to you for approval on September 11th. And then I'll start the school visits where I go out to every site and every department and share information and educate. And then the open enrollment will begin. It's a four week process. The first week is online. Then there's two weeks where we have combined benefits group representatives who are at every site. People can sign up for a 15 minute slot to talk about their decisions for 2018. And then we'll finish up the open enrollment and get things changed and fixed and ready to go for 2018. I have a few other little updates to give you um, before I move off of renewal. Any other discussion about the renewal? Well, my only discussion would be um, I would like to have a discussion on bargaining if we can do a shade session right after this so that we can be clear on, on what the board's desire is. Would that be? Would we can that do that. Okay? Yep. Board's desire of a plan? Pardon me? Or Oh, oh no, no, the 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 board bench, board bench, yeah, not not the plan. Because the okay. what's bar, yeah, what's yeah, we can do that. Yes, ma'am. Just wanted to share with you our wellness center utilization, just to kind of go over those statistics with you. So when you look at both centers, Inverness and Beverly Hills, and you're looking at both schedules, sheriff's office folks, our folks. This is our total utilization of those facilities on the top line. We dipped down a little bit in April. We put in some strategies. We dipped back down in June. So we really are trying to hit those strategies um, harder to make sure that utilization is up. We don't want providers sitting there and not seeing patients. We want, we want to fill the schedules. If we need to cut the schedules back, whatever we need to do, we want our utilization to go up. And I feel like we see a little bit of a an improvement in July. So we're going to stay on that and continue to improve. When you look at the second line for school district, that's just looking, it's looking at both centers, but what portion is being utilized by the school district. So looking at both centers, month of July, 69% usage is by school district folks. Then we break it down by center. If you look at the Inverness Center, again, the top line's both schedules, Sheriff's Office and us, the total utilization of the Inverness Center is 80%, but then when you look at what percent is being utilized by the school district, we're utilizing 74% of the time in, at the Inverness Wellness Center. And then the same for Beverly Hills. Ms. Powers, I mean, if you had asked a question about how the billing, we, we track from the sheriff and from the school district, it's by employee, so if, they, if I'm an employee of the sheriff and I get a lab, you're, you're not paying for that. There's no reimbursements back and forth between. If that bill goes to the sheriff, and then if your employee gets a lab, the bill comes to you. So it's, we, we separate it at point of service. There's no commingling of any funds. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that is... That yeah, is, we keep an eye on it. Yeah, so even to the doctor's time, so what happens is, is the schedule based on, we run the report, so the sheriff basically gets a bill for the balance uh, at, you know, based on each percentage, uh, percentage ratio. So the only thing that is, is, is you know, you're taking care of your, your operational costs in Beverly Hills, they're taking care of the operational costs, uh, you know, the rent and so like bill right. and so forth. So that's not being true. No. Let me share schedule, schedule times I ask because I know once I had a time schedule, I told them they couldn't find it all. They, they wrote out for me, so I take it in. But um, do they communicate with each other like, like it's uh, Beverly Hills sends you over here? Sure. Hmm? How do they communicate? The, um, the staff needs to call down to Inverness, sure. They can look at it and they can pull the schedule up and, and 
if, if say Beverly Hills was full and they want to pull up Ember and schedule, sure, they could do that and, and book in and we could go down. Uh, one other comment about from the educational thing that I, I think that the team does well, and, and we, sh we share this on the annual review, is the amount of money and co-pays that the employees don't have to pay. That is, that's a very good point. Because um, if you go to the wellness center, it's free. Well, well you don't pay anything. <laughs> well, you don't pay anything, I guess. There. It's even bigger than that because yeah. you you would have had an office copay. Right. If you've had if you have to have a lab, you're going to go somewhere and pay for that. Right. And a drug. So it's there's a lot, and we show it annually what what based on the number of visits that we do. Mm -hmm. So when you when you look at and again most folks look at the paycheck right and right. what's coming out, but there is a, there is an overall savings that they got to really look yes. at. Yes. Some of those reports and the, the presentation that you've done or and have put together, is there any place to be able to share that online so that the employees that don't go some, you know, that don't get to the meeting or that we, when we get these phone calls and these comments, we can point them to the, to the you know, to the district website or something and say, listen, there's, here's information that shows what your savings is, what, you know, has the benefits are, how insurance works. Because I don't know that we, we had that. And I'm not talking about reinventing the wheel. I'm just saying if there's presentations that, that we're doing. Don't give Sherry another thing to do. No, that's why I don't want to do that. I'm just saying if there's a, a way to capture that. It is a mandatory meeting. And if they're not at the meeting, somebody at the school sends them the PowerPoint. The secretary has a list of who doesn't come to the meeting, and they get the PowerPoint. So everybody should have it. And if they have questions, you know, they can call us. Okay. And at this, I think I'd like to just mention that Kim is fabulous. When she gets phone calls, she's, no matter how busy she is and how she's pulling her hair out, she stops what she's doing, she's friendly, she tells people no problem, she doesn't mind helping them. So, I mean, she's very, very good and friendly and explains things very well to the employees. She took care of me this morning. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Full time, time job. job. <laughs> Sherry, before we leave that last slide on the utilization, how is our... Um, no show policy. Oh, that's the next slide. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so our no shows, we did implement the no show policy in 2016 from January through July. We had 400 and 2017, same timeline. We have about a 25% reduction in no shows. So that that's good. It's helping. We've had 13 payroll deductions. That's 12 people because one person has been dinged twice. So um, 13 payroll deductions, and then in addition, two retirees we have invoiced for the no-show fee. So we believe it's working. I think maybe we would have hoped that it had been a greater reduction, so we will spend time on that when I go to the, the schools to visit as far as educating, you know, how it benefits all of us to not have no-shows. So. Good job. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you all. What a thankless job you have. <laughs> I thank her all the time. Oh, good. good. You keep thanking her. You keep thanking her. All right. I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And then I'm opening the shade meeting. Thank you. Yeah, we'll come back at a quarter of. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. How are you? How are you?